I think I'm alive. Hello, everyone. Hold on a second. Fixing up stuff. <laughs> Wait a minute. I'm in a weird place. Hi. Okay. So <laughs> good evening, everyone. Um, the first, let me know if you can see and if you can hear me or if something looks off. Does anything look off to you like fuzzy wuzzy, too dark? You know, because I can never tell. So hello, David. Welcome. I'm glad you made it here. That's fantastic. Oh my gosh. Okay. Uh, somebody tell me if you can see and hear me. Okay. Okay. Thank God. All right. Um, before I start, I just want to tell everybody who's come here and is going to listen to the show later on. The reason you're not here for live is because you have to join Patreon, which is in the link below. So please do that um, because boy, does this channel need support. Um, uh, my last two videos, Amanda Knox and the uh, Darlie Wuchir videos, both got demonetized as I expected, <laughs> which is so frustrating because that's what usually keeps a channel going. So I think I'm going to be depending on Patreon a lot. So thank you, everybody who, hello, Florence, uh, everybody who's here, um, who's joined Patreon to be here and support me. I, oh, I can't tell you how much I appreciate it because YouTube is not doing me any favors. And um, okay, so before I start, I just want to warn you of one thing today. Um, I just hurt my back really badly. Um, playing table tennis, I jammed a foot and then my body went some weird way. So I'm in a lot of pain and I took Advil, but you know, it's not exactly working. So, um, I thought I'd show you this little thing here. You see, this, this is really cute. This is, uh, uh, it's El Dia de, de how do you say it again? It's a Dia de, El Dia de Muertos in Mexico. Has anybody been to Mexico and is familiar with this celebration of the dead in Mexico? And this is one of their a beautiful um, souvenir I brought back. Um, and, you know, Mexicans always like to drink something like un refresco in here, like like a refresco, like a soda, like a ginger ale, like, you know, some mild thing. Oh, yep. Ginger ale. Mm, I'm hoping ginger ale will get me through the show. And, you know, ginger ale. I'm sure, I'm sure that's what's in there. Yeah, I'm sure it's ginger ale. So now I'll get demonetized for encouraging alcohol. No, Annie, you wouldn't think that's tequila, would you? No. <laughs> I'll get demonetized for this, I know, but tonight I just don't care because <sighs> I'm trying not to scream in pain. So <laughs> we'll see if it helps, Michelle. But, you know, that Advil is not working and I do not take any other kinds of medications. And, oh, my God, I woke up this morning and I could hardly get out of bed. So I'm hoping it's a temporary just a pulled muscle. But, wow, does it hurt. But anyway, Dia de los Muertos. Oh, mm -hmm -hmm. oh no moonshine. Thank you, Molly. No moonshine. Whew. Not at all. Ah, but <laughs> Oh, maybe I'll tell you a story about this, by the way. Just an just amusing story about cultural differences. Um, so before I went to Mexico, I was watching these uh, telenovelas, Mexican telenovelas, which always have people drinking like tequila at nine o'clock in the morning. And every time they get together, men, women, doesn't matter. They always pour tequila and they always drink. They sip. They don't chug it. They sip it. And I'm like, how come in America when they do that, it's always at you know, midnight and it's always a bunch of college kids going, <laughs> You know, and then they have the salt and the lime, and it's all gross. I'm like, how come Mexico? How come it doesn't look that way in Mexico? I said, maybe it's just a telenovela. You know, it's just the, it's just the movies, and because these are all drug dealers in these shows, so I'm thinking the cartels. That's what they do. I got down to Mexico, and the first place I went to in Mexico, stayed at this ranch, and the woman came out to greet us, and she literally came out to greet us and said, "Tequila, anyone? Tequila?" I was like, "Okay, I guess it is a thing down here." And then I found out the reason they didn't have to chug the tequila in Mexico is because it doesn't taste like the nasty stuff we drink here in this country. And so their tequila is much better. You can buy this tequila in this country, but most Americans are buying the really crummy stuff that's it's not something you can sip. It's something you have to uh, <clears throat> be really drunk to drink and to even to even drink in the first place. <laughs> so anyway, that's my Mexican story. Now to today. Um, I want to talk about a couple of different things uh, which have just come up. I'm, I did mention I was going to talk about a little missing Cleo Smith case, but I'm going to do a separate 
I'm going to do a separate video on that right after I finish this show, because I want to discuss how police investigate. And I want to do that in a separate form so that people come specifically for that, because I got some really interesting um angry people at me because some things I said that because they had made their decision what they thought happened. And I was talking from an investigative point of view. And so I want to explain, yes, wasn't that great? I mean, oh my God, she was found safe. Yes, Michelle, she, she was found safe. And the, what they call her, I'll, I will say this one thing, and then I'll probably repeat this in that other show. And when I'm discussing all the investigative issues, some will call her a black swan in the sense that she should not have been found alive according to all statistics. Um, children who are kidnapped like this almost always are found dead within hours because they're usually taken by child predators and the child predators sexually assault them and then kill them. Um, and they say there's a few that that doesn't happen to. And what they always point to, however, are teenagers, teenagers like JC, JC Dugard. Um, that's not the same thing as a four-year-old because a teenager, you can put a teenager in your basement and you can teach her what you want her to do. And you can rational, ra I know, you can reason with her. And you can you can do things to make her, you can do things to her and, and terrify her in a way that she can use her brain to say, I don't want to, I don't want to fight back against this guy. On top of that, then you can get her to do your housework. <laughs> you can get her to cook your food, iron your clothes. Um, and then at some point they get so sometimes so used to being there. Uh, they suffer from Stockholm syndrome and then they can, they start relating to their captor as a, like a husband or a boyfriend in a very weird way. Those are the ones they usually keep alive. Most of them still get killed off. Most teenagers still get raped and murdered and are still dead within an hour, but some will be put in the basement because they can make use of them. And they, the, that, that teenager can take care of themselves. Now you bring home a four-year-old, you, you got to deal with that kid. You know, you got to deal with their bathroom issues. You got to deal with them crying and whining and just, I mean, it's hard to deal with your own dang four-year-old. You want somebody else's four-year-old, <laughs> you know, they're not fun to take care of. And so I don't even hardly ever have heard of a, a, that young a child. I'm trying to think of a case. And if you can think of a case, let me know of a, of a two, three, four-year-old child who's kidnapped by a sex predator and isn't murdered quickly. Um, I honestly off the off the cuff can't think of one. Um, so that doesn't that really doesn't happen. Um, so when this little girl went missing, the question if she was truly taken by a stranger, the expectation was she would be dead within a two or three hours. But you know, look how much time went by, and she was actually being kept in this guy's house, and he was caring for her in some way, uh, apparently feeding her. Um, supposedly went out for diapers. So I'm not sure why she's in diapers at that age, but okay. Um, and, and, uh, also she was playing with toys when they found her. So he was actually providing some kind of an environment for her. So weird. Now I don't know yet anything about this guy, as far as I know what his age is. I think he's 36. People say he's weird. Um, but why he targeted her, what he wanted with her, how he treated her, how he even found her at the campground, all these things we don't know yet. And it's a very strange case. It's even a strange case without the fact she was found alive. It's just a strange case. And so I will not speak on what I, you know, I don't know how this, I'm looking every day, I'm looking for the information like, okay, okay, uh, let us know, let us know. How did he find her? You know, where did he, you know, I don't understand it. It's, it's very weird. Um, so I'm hoping we'll find out all those details soon, but I'm going to do a, a really quick show later, just going through the investigative issues in the case, because people have misunderstood that. And I want them to understand what you, what you should be doing in a case like that and what, what police sometimes tell the public and what they don't tell the public and all of that. So I will, I will do something later on that. Now um, I want to talk about, I've got, I've got some questions I asked you. I'm going to come to that in a little bit. I want to talk a little bit about evidence and then the Barry Morphew. And this is going to, the Barry Morphew case has gotten really weird. So, oh, before I do that, I just wanted to, I just wanted to do, where's my fun thing? I want to do this fun thing with you guys. Okay. I, I, I want you to tell me, hold on a second. I got to find this picture. Okay. So 
I'm going to show you a picture. A picture. This is just this is just about what we think killers look like, and and what can we identify killers one from the other um, in a lineup, for example. And we think it's a lot easier than it is. And so I'm going to show you. First, I want to show you a picture of four people, and you tell me which one who you think the killer is. This is going to be guy number one, guy number two, guy number three. Guy number four. What do you think? Which one is a serial killer? One, two, three, or four? I want to see what the consensus is here. Everybody? I, ho I hope there's not a huge lag on the... Uh, the uh, oh, maybe that's doing something weird here. Hold on a second. No, that's not it. Sometimes there's a lag time on YouTube, which I don't see when I do um, smash, smash words. So come on, guys. Number three. Okay, one, two, you think number three, okay. What, uh, as Molly says three, Annie, Hallie says three, Florence, Florence says four, okay. Who's left? Michelle, what do you think? Uh, Lisa says, I really, she, she says I'm taking the fifth. <laughs> David, you're here, what do you think? A guy's perspective, one, two, three, or four? Michelle says one, David says four. Wow, Michelle? You're correct. That is actually the serial killer. These guys are cops. <laughs> you know, so that's, it's, yeah, see, number two looks, scary. he does look kind of scary, doesn't he? But, you know, everybody has a bad day. Everybody, can, this guy looks like, oh, hi, I work at the office. You know, it really doesn't look like he should be one, but that's, that's the whole funny thing about it. Okay. Now here's the second one. I've got, I've got, I've got three of these. Okay. Can anybody tell me? Who, who this is? Oh, see if I can get, I'm trying to get my face out of the way. Who, the, who is this? Anybody? <laughs> who do you think this is? Okay. Ted Kaczynski. Yes, you are right, Lisa. Ted Kaczynski. Okay, it's the Unabomber. But the, actually, no. Only one of them is the Unabomber. Does anybody know? Okay, so watch again. One, two, or three. Who's the Unabomber? <laughs> <laughs> which which is it? One, two, or three? Number three is going with number two. Anybody else? Number two? Number two. Well, you're all for number two. Ah, except for Lisa, who makes this number three. Huh. Okay. You know, quite frankly, I can't remember. <laughs> I honestly can't remember. I have, I, I found these in a box of uh, stuff I used to use uh, for teaching college. And I'm like, oh, I remember doing this, but I don't know where my notes are. So you all think it is number two, huh? But this guy, the funny thing about this is this guy looks so much like him. This is actually a criminal profiler I worked with. <laughs> and I thought that was funny because I'm like, man, that my buddy looks like Ted Kaczynski. <laughs> it's kind of creepy, you know? It's like, hmm. Yeah. So, and then this is the last one. Question is, Okay, which one is the lawyer and which one is the serial killer? So we'll go with one and two. Which one's a lawyer? One and two. Which one's a serial killer? <laughs> what do you think? <laughs> mm. One is the lawyer. Lisa says two. Uh, the other Lisa says two. There's two Lisas. One says one, one says two. One, uh, Molly says one is the lawyer and two is a serial killer. Uh, oh, Michelle says one is a lawyer and two is a serial killer. Interesting. There's a lot of agreement here. Actually, you're correct. That actually is the lawyer and that actually is a serial killer. But, you know, this guy looks like, you, you know, he actually looks creepier, though, doesn't he? <laughs> People say maybe that's because he's a lawyer. But, <laughs> but again, you know, you this is what happens sometimes when people get to court uh, because they see this guy here and they're like, he looks like a nice guy. I mean, I can't believe he's a serial killer. And, and it starts messing with their brain and, and it makes it hard for people to sometimes, you know, believe that they committed the crimes they committed. And sometimes it's just a matter of, uh, you know, when you're, when you're doing lineup um, that you, you can't pick the guy out because everybody look. some people look similar. I mean, I, I have what's called face blindness. I'm, at least I, I'm going to claim I have face blindness. I have real trouble telling people apart. Um, I, I can't remember people. I see them 
a day before and I can't identify them. I'm like, I think I know that person, but I'm not sure. <laughs> Turns out I spent two hours with them the day before. A really bad time with it. Um, and I've always had a bad time with it. So don't ask me to be a witness. I suck. So, but I just thought that was a really kind of interesting thing when you look at who looks like, who looks like a killer, who doesn't look like a killer, you know, and it does affect people when you get into court. Now, I want to talk about something else that affects people when you get into court, and that is evidence issues and the experts. And we're going to see this with, we saw this with, or we're seeing it a lot um, with the Darley Routier case, because they are just, is this the one I wanted? That is not what I even want. Hold on a second. Ah, got disappear. Oh, oh, that hurt. Oh, okay. Um, I wrote a thing here called once upon a time called in my expert opinion at, about experts. Who are these experts in the courtroom? And one of the things you'll notice when you, um, uh, Lisa says prosopagnosia. Wow. Is that a fancy term for face blindness? Wow. Okay. I'm not going to remember that. <laughs> also have memory problems. Um, <laughs> pro prosopagnosia. Wow. Um, so one of the problems with experts, and you'll see this, when, when you put an expert on the stand in the courtroom, they spend like an hour going through the guy's credentials. And, and so the prosecution puts the person up and then they go, this is all the great credentials this guy has. And then the defense gets up and tries to trash his credentials. And then vice versa, the defense puts somebody on and says, you know, okay, you've been in the field how many years and how many degrees do you have and how many cases have you worked? And, you know, and then the prosecution tries to tear him into shreds. Um, I've always thought this was really kind of odd because you've got this jury there and you've got people basically trying to trash the experts that are on the stand. Now, if you're part of the jury, how are you going to know what expert to even believe? Because after you've been told that the expert some expert isn't as good as another expert and he's not really qualified according to the prosecution or according to the defense. I mean, here's the, the jury going, well, first of all, they're bored out of their minds. I was reading the, the Darley Routier court, court, uh, you know, the, the, the uh, court transcripts, man, was I bored. I was so freaking bored. And I'm thinking, by God, how long do these people have to sit there and listen to this nonsense, picky, picky, picky little stuff and picking people apart. And, um, one of the people they had picked apart was the crime scene. I, I talked about this on the last show, the crime scene guy that came, he was considered a crime scene expert and they tried to shred him. And, and, and Dr. Grande tried to shred him too. Said, well, you know, he was a so-called, so-called expert and he was only there 20 or 30 minutes before he decided there was no stranger. And then, and then this goes to court and that's what they start doing uh, to the experts in court. Uh, if you wonder why you'll never see me in a court, it's because because I have, I'm an, I'm a renegade in this field. I'm, I'm independent and I'm a renegade and they would tear me into little teeny weeny pieces. So nobody, nobody would put me on a stand. And so that when people say, well, you're not a real profile because you've never testified in court. I'm like, well, you know, it's because the court actually probably doesn't consider me one when it comes down to what the other attorney can do to me. So they may, the prosecution could love me, but they'll know the defense will tear me to shreds and the defense could want to put me up there, but they know the prosecution is going to tear me to shreds. So I'm never going to see the inside of a courtroom for that reason. And personally, I don't really want to be there. So I'm, I'm okay. But the question is who is an expert? And so I wrote this, I said, experts, they come a dime a dozen. You can buy one for either side of the courtroom. And believe me, sometimes the amount of money they pay these guys, amazing amount of money that they pay these guys. And sometimes when they don't pay them, uh, there was one, and I really objected to this guy, and I don't want, this is not a political issue here, but in the George Floyd case, they had a guy coming on who was supposed to talk about the breathing issues. And he said, I didn't take any money because it, he, he supposedly wanted to be neutral, which was really interesting because he has testified in God knows how many other cases where his where patients have died in hospitals and he's testified for both the prosecution and the defense for a whole pile of money so all of a sudden he doesn't take any money well i'm going to say he didn't take any money because he had a an agenda himself a political agenda himself that he could see justice done in his own mind whatever he thought justice was didn't take any money but i'm like that doesn't make you any any more but shouldn't make you any more believable you know than every other case that you took money for. Hmm, actually makes me kind of question. But the problem is you do pay for these guys. And, you, you know, the payment can change. It's, you know, it's not like, 
you know, want, if, if you want the really big dude, I mean, you can get a, uh, you can get an expert from somebody guy in town who works on you know, crime scene stuff and you can pay him a hundred dollars an hour, or you can get a big wig. You know, one of those guys that shows up on all the television shows um, and you get that guy in court. And I don't know what the heck you're paying him per hour, but some of those guys walked away with like 30,000, $40,000 for testifying. It's insane. And that is not brought up in the court. And so, you know, it's like, so is the guy willing to say anything because you're willing to pay him? Is he willing to twist what he has to say to match the defense or match the prosecution? I find that's that right there shouldn't even happen. I, that, that really, really bothers me. But then, it goes, so I go on here, it says, some experts do nothing but make a career out of being experts. And that is where some money is. So they can make a very good living at that. That may literally be the only thing they do. So you do need experts though. Law enforcement needs specialized assistance. Prosecutors and defense attorneys do need expert testimony for court. Families looking for help in solving homicides. They want to get, they want an expert. And an expert will render that opinion for some amount of money. And this opinion will do some good, or will it? You know, that's the question. So we have, we have two central issues when we're talking about the use of an expert. What makes an expert an expert? <laughs> and what value is the information rendered by this expert? So What's an expert? On face value, it's an easy question. An expert simply one is an expert in his field. But is everyone in the field an expert simply because he is in the field? <laughs> or do the years in the field determine expertness? Does a person become an expert after five years? Mm, or is it 10 years? Or is it 20 years? Or what if the, he's still a doofus after 30 years in the field? Because we all know those dudes, you know what I mean? Uh, that guy like, man, he's been a doctor for for, for 50 years, but he's an idiot. <laughs> you know? Yeah. Now, there's people who just aren't good at what they do. And sometimes they become less good at what they do because they don't keep up with not, you know, the new information. They don't read all the stuff they should be reading and they've, they, they gotten complacent and they just go downhill. Um, perhaps it isn't the years in the field that make one an expert. It must be the educational degrees, right? Deciding factor. How much education do you have? Is one an expert with a bachelor's or do you have to have at least a master's? Or is it not good enough? You have to have a PhD. And let me tell you, pretty much these days, they want that PhD. Um, and I don't know that getting a PhD gives you any more knowledge, actually, in the long run than if you didn't have the PhD. So what happens to an individual who has 30 years experience but doesn't have a degree at all? Are they an expert? Even if they've had 30 years of experience working with everything, yeah, are they not an expert? Um, or, or here's something else. We can also argue about where the degree is from. Do the experts have to come from Harvard? Or how about a degree from a small college? Is that okay? <laughs> what happens if the guy's from Harvard with 30 years experience and he still has no skill or brains? Is he more of an expert than a young person who just happened to be brilliant right from the start? So now we got the problem that the, uh, an expert is only an expert in the eye of the beholder. And when it comes to courtroom situations, the defense, that's the eye of that beholder. And then the prosecutions, that's the eye of that beholder. And then they try to tell the jury what their eyes should behold. Um, so now we got a problem. So now the guy gives an explanation. Now there's a difference between an explanation and an opinion. An explanation is different from an opinion in that it's expected to be more than just a couple quick words. An opinion can tell us nothing near to an explanation as in a doctor telling his patient, in my professional opinion, uh, you having, you're having problems with the gallbladder and you need an operation. That's not an explanation. And he might never give an explanation. Now, if the patient actually asks for the explanation, the doctor might give one, he might get mad. <laughs> because he doesn't, why just, just, just believe me, just do what I say. So an opinion is, should not should only be an opening statement for an explanation. And that's very, very important. But then after the uh, they give that, uh, that uh, uh, opinion or that explanation, now the problem comes down to, do we believe that explanation? Hmm. So I'm not going to read the rest of that, but I do want to read this. So now you're in court. All right. So, so now you get the expert up there and I just want to ask you what you about this. So the experts up there, this is going to be the expert for uh, uh, the prosecution. And it's going to, it's, it, they say, well, how do you know what the threshold is? Your threshold detection control and, 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 and uh, DNA testing. What is your threshold detection control? Oh, well, it's, it is important, you know, it's important to have uh, some means of positively establishing whether the amplification or typing conditions during a particular run were sufficient to amplify and detect a predetermined minimum amount of sample. 
and it helps in deciding as faint or weak signals should be countered or as real allows, or, or they're just minor artifacts. Uh, and, you know, we have an integral internal control that, we're, that serves this purpose. And, and then the laboratories that we use try to establish and they include their own threshold de detections, which we believe are the proper threshold detections. Uh, and, and so we, we are up to standards. Hello. How many of you understood what the hell I was talking about? Just, just, let, just let me know. Did, you know, you're on the jury now. And you want to know whether that expert in DNA analysis knows what he's talking about. Do you understand what I read? And I'm going to say, probably not. Nobody's responded. They're like, well, I don't know what you said. That came from a, a book that I very much appreciate, one of the finest books in, uh, in, in a crime scene analysis. It's called Forensic DNA Analysis. It was done by Keith Inman and Nora Rudin. They're like, super experts in this field. I have read this book or tried to read this book. I have, and, and when I've had certain issues about uh, uh, about DNA, whether the samples, what, what I need to know about the samples to know whether, I, you know, this sample is, is ra rational or whether they've proven anything. I've used this book, but yes, as David says, it's definitely not intended for a lay person to understand. You betcha. But now, here's the thing that just drives me nuts with all of the, jur the civil, civil jury system, civilian jury system. So, so the prosecution is uh, Dr. A. Dr. A says what I just said. <laughs> Lisa says, perhaps that's the point. Yeah, they're not supposed to understand. The problem is it's very, very technical. These people that wrote this book, let me see who they, uh, I, 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 know, I know their names in the field. Um, I just want to see what, what uh, somebody says about, about who they are. Okay. Keith Inman, he has, actually he's, he's a criminologist and Nora Rudin has a PhD. Nora Rudin is the PhD person. She has a PhD in genetics and molecular biology from Brandeis University. She did a postdoctoral at Lawrence Berkeley Laboratory, worked as a three time years as a full-time consultant for the California Department of Justice DNA Laboratory and so on and so forth. And the other guy's been in the field forever too. So now you've got Dr. A, let's say Dr. Rudin, right? And she's standing up there and she's just said what I've said because they want to know whether you can believe the DNA in this particular case. Because let's say, mm, okay, let's go back to the, uh, um, um, I lost my mind. <laughs> Amanda Knox case. Let's go back to the Amanda Knox case. The tiny piece of DNA that was on the bra, this little teeny thing, bra clasp that broke off. Little teeny bra clasp, one tiny piece of supposed DNA, some touch DNA of some sort that was supposedly Raffaele's. And that, you know, in that case. Okay, now here's the problem. I don't know. I, I can read all the information about the laboratory methodology on whether that DNA is believable or it's not believable or whether it's contamination or whether there was um, uh, the person doing it had a confirmation bias that wanted it to be him. So they saw because you, people don't understand. You have to you have to read things and see where the matches come in. It doesn't you know, you don't you don't put something in and it pops up on your screen and says it's Raffaele. You know, it's not like that. You have to you have to. Sometimes you can say, well, I think it's close enough to say it is. Sometimes you say, I don't think it's close enough to say it is. That's subjective. So anyway, now you have Dr. A, let's say, with a clasp. And Dr. A says what I just said. Now, our laboratories follow blah, 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 blah. And she explains all this stuff. Then the defense attorney gets up there and says, I've heard your, uh, sometimes there's problems in the laboratory. And then, the la then the, he starts asking questions that are very complicated. She answers them. Meanwhile, the, the jury is like this. I have no clue what the hell's going on. Then, then the defense attorney puts, the defense puts on their Dr. B. And Dr. B says the exact opposite. Well, we had that tested in our laboratories and we followed the such and such procedures and our procedures were finer than the laboratory over there. And we've come up with the fact that this does not, the, the DNA on this is not sufficient enough to match with, with any kind of confidence to Raffaele. And then the, and then the prosecution jumps up and attacks him. So now, 
Now at the end of all of that, and maybe a month worth of boredom, the jury goes, sits in the jury room and they're like, what do you think about that DNA? <laughs> Except they were, they were in Italy, so they say it with an Italian accent. <laughs> what do you think about that DNA? And they're like, well, I don't know. Because not because one guy's a bus driver and the other guy person's a teacher and the third one is a chef. I don't know a damn thing about DNA. And my God, do you know how much work it took Dr. Rudin to become what she became and to be at that level and to write this book? It's it's insanity. Hey, my God. welcome, by the way. I won't say the whole name because I can't I can't say your whole name here, but I'll just call you Stank because <laughs> it's cute. But I won't say the whole name. Stank is here, and I'm glad you're here. Um Oh, good Lord. Uh, David said, David says they would need a second expert to break down Barney style so the jury could understand, but the jury will never understand because it's too complicated. It is entirely too complicated. And that is the problem. Same thing happened when you take the Darley Routier case. So the, one of the big things the case hinged on was the bread knife, the bread knife supposedly from the kitchen of Darley supposedly saw through the screen. And there was evidence on the bread. The, when they did testing, they found evidence on the bread knife that matched the screen, uh, the, the, the material. And that's huge. That's huge because if that's true, there's no intruder that somehow got into the house, then cut the screen, and then put the bread knife back. It makes no sense. So that doesn't, that doesn't work. So if that bread knife were indeed used to cut the screen, it is a staged crime scene. But the defense jumps up and says, wait a minute, that that testing was incorrect. That testing was was not valid. And we did other testing ourselves. We've come up with that. It isn't that 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 the materials came from a from the from the from the detective brushing things with a with a with a, with a brush. OK, now you're the jury. How the heck are you supposed to know scientifically who's telling the truth? It's an impossible task. And. Until we in the in, in whatever country uses a jur civilian jury system recognizes this, we're screwed because this is where we end up now. What usually ends up in a lot of these cases is that if you if if the first time around the jury convicts, uh, they they spend the next years getting the appeal and they dredge up a whole lot of experts, and then by the time it goes time, you've got much more many more experts picking on different things. And, and an interesting thing happens. If the, ex, if the expert, so how does this work? If the defense expert says, for example, let's go back to the bread knife. The defense expert says that the bread knife was not used. It, it, was, it was something else. Well, that automatically throws doubt that Darlie Routier is guilty. And so all you need to do is throw doubt. So even if the even if what the prosecution said, well, we've got great scientific stuff that proves it is the bread knife that was used, and that should prove she did it, all you have to do is say the opposite, and you can throw doubt. And so and automatically you go from conviction to reasonable doubt because now you don't know if the, who's telling the truth and maybe the defense is right. You don't even have to know if the defense is right. Just maybe they are, and if they are, I know their experts said it isn't that. So now I have doubt. And as soon as I have doubt, you don't even necessarily have to have doubt about Darley. You just have to have doubt about the evidence. And so what's happening today is the defense has gotten smart. They're throwing a huge amount of doubt on evidence because that way they, they know they can confuse the jury and that that'll dredge up the doubt. And there, there it goes. The case will go in their favor usually. Um, so it's, it's um, the whole thing about evidence is just, kind of drives me nuts because if we knew how, how much the, the you know, and I, it's not like the jury's not trying their, their, their best. Their, their jury can be very wonderful people and may, and some of them can be very logical. But when I just read that crap to you out of here, I'm sure most of you had no clue what the hell I was even reading to you because a lot of even the language of this is language that unless you've studied DNA and testing methodologies, you don't even understand the language. You know, it's like, is that English? <laughs> I didn't get it. <laughs> so it just really, really bugs me. Uh, so and 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 on top of that, um, most people have not even had even a basic understanding of science. I, I know, you know, even myself. I mean, you know, I never took chemistry. <laughs> I took biology in high school, and I let the frogs go, and I got it. And 
I got a D for that class because the teacher wasn't happy about me. And that was the last time I took science. Um, but I have read a tremendous amount. But I don't consider myself an expert in anything that uh, when it comes to be evidence related, I have to use uh, my knowledge of crime scene uh, evidence, uh, crime scene um, analysis, and work very hard to try to understand what they're actually saying. And that's what the jury doesn't have a chance to do. The jury does not do that. First of all, you've left the jury. This is what I don't understand either. The jury is sitting there day after day after that, being bored to the gore, bored to the gore. I mean, because most of the stuff they say in court is nonsense and, and garbage. Like, so how many years? Oh, it was three years. Or uh, I thought, I believe that it was about actually three years and 11 months. Oh, three years and 11 months. Were you actually on campus? Or were you off of campus? Well, I was out on campus. How, how many years were you at that particular campus? Or you, were you at three different campuses? Yeah, you're so bored. You're falling asleep. You're trying to stay awake and you do this all day long. You're not going to go back to your hotel room where you're uh, sequestered or to your home and start studying books on DNA evidence. I mean, you're just not. You're not going to. You're not going to be able to suddenly become smart in a short period of time. I mean, ugh. so. But here's a really interesting thing. Speaking of evidence, which came up today, and that's the Barry Morphew case. And I have not seen this done yet, but I'm like, holy God, is this fascinating? Let's see. Where did I do with it? Okay. Okay. Hold on. More ginger ale. Hmm. Ah, really good ginger. Okay, dokie. Um, Barry Morphew. I don't know if how many of you have heard this. This is amazing. I've never seen this before. Attorneys representing, in case you don't know who Barry Morphew is, he's the he's the um, guy who um, in Colorado whose wife supposedly went for a bike ride and her, they found her bike but not her. And they suspected that he killed her because she wanted to leave him. And um, so he is the one and only suspect and the police have, they did arrest him and they, he's, he's out on, uh, he's out on, um, he got a, a $500,000. He was able to, yeah, the cash bond was 500,000. So he's running around. But anyway, I think he's got an ankle bracelet or something. But um, attorneys representing Barry Morphew intend to sue prosecutors and investigators for what they claim is unlawful arrest malicious prosecution and defamation. Who does that before a trial? I've never seen that done before a trial. What they're claiming is that, let's see, they claim, here, here, here comes the evidence stuff. They allege, the, this is the attorney's DNA evidence found in the glove box of Suzanne's car matches the same profile as a single or multiple individuals what? across the country involved in sexual assault cases. What? <laughs> what? <laughs> I mean, mm -mm -mm. <laughs> well, uh, Michelle says, I I've been following more few cases since the beginning. I can't believe his ankle monitor isn't working properly. Really? It's not hmm, because, you know, Mexico's, well, a little south, a little south. I, you know, dude, uh, <laughs> you know, um, so, so essentially, um, uh, Michelle says he has two prominent defense attorneys. It'll be quite a ride going into and during the trial. Oh, my Lord. Yeah. So essentially, they're trying to say that there was some DNA. And I saw this someplace else where they were claiming it. Like, there's a bunch of different guys who the DNA belongs to are all like serial killers. And I'm like, well, how many? What do they have? A, <laughs> do they, they have like a oh, you know, let's all go to Colorado and find a girl. And they all just met there in a big conference and all the serial killers showed up at, you know, the Morpheus house and 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 said, hey, there she is, let's get her. And they all left their DNA all over her car. I mean, what? I mean, I don't even understand what they're trying to say. But see what they're doing. They don't have to prove this, you know, at the moment. They can just simply say, we we have DNA that matches blah, 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 blah. Do you remember the Jean Bonnet thing about the touch DNA in her panties, I believe it was? Touch DNA. It's like so like minuscule. So you have you have a serial killer, supposedly. This is you know, this is what they're trying. No, the defense is trying, well, their whatever team it is, is trying to say um that uh Somehow, some guy got in there and, and committed this crime, and he just left. What? 
tiny touch of DNA, as if it couldn't come from the factory worker who may put the panties there, or somebody else where you know passed through hands or whatever. Somebody's doing laundry or whatever. You know, it, it, it's so not very strong. Let's put it that way. <coughs> Excuse me a second. Where's my regular water? Okay, this is Diet Pepsi. Mm. Okay, so they don't have to prove anything at this point. They're just saying our experts, whatever experts those were, I was just talking about, our experts, and you can find those experts, have said that some of this DNA belongs to sex offenders. Like half the sex offenders apparently in the United States have that DNA. So now they're claiming, and this is what they're claiming. Uh, they allege DNA evidence found in the glove box of Suzanne Carr matches some profile of possible sex offenders. Morphe's attorneys contend after a year of having obtained the DNA evidence, the, the, the uh, dep, uh, county, the Chaffee County deputy, Lin, Jeff Lindsay, the DA, followed up on an individual in Phoenix who appeared to, appeared, you see those lovely words, appeared to match the DNA profile found on Suzanne's glove box. But the Arizona individual refused to cooperate and retained a lawyer according to the documents. And then the attorneys also provided other examples of alleged mishandling of the case. They claim the affidavit omits other evidence, including an alleged incident involving a tranquilizer dart. And then they also say they allege in the affidavit that she was messaging, Suzanne was messaging with Jeff Lieb Libler, I don't know how to pronounce that dude's name, the man with whom she had been having a multi-year affair. Morphew got back to their home and is thought by investigators to, wait a minute. Oh, then Morphe got back into the home and is thought by investigators to have used a tranquilizer dart to incapacitate Suzanne. But Morphe's attorneys claimed that when investigators discovered the dart rifle, it was inoperable and ha had not been used in a long time. They allege this information and the DNA evidence allegedly found on the glove box was purposely omitted from the arrest affidavit. Aff affidavit, what did I just say? Affidavit. Um, so now they're already trying the case outside court and before anybody is actually prosecuted. <laughs> so do you think this is not going to influence a jury? Of course, that's exactly why they're doing this. They want to influence any future jury because in, in this crazy world that we live in with 24 hour of, uh, media and 24 hour internet of all sorts, everything, when a person sits there and says, has a goal to say to the, the, the when they're questioning them, you know, and, and jury, when they're trying to pick the jury and they go, do you know anything about this case? And I said, I've never heard of this case. The lying dogs. You're a lying dog. You, of course, you know about this case. You, you were, the minute they called you for jury duty, you're like, and you've read everything and you already decided whether well, that person's guilty or innocent. So you're already sitting there going, nope, I never heard anything. I and now what they want to do is taint the jury, whole taint the whole, the whole shebang. Um, and so the media is picking up on this. It's going to, they know the media is going to run with it. They, they, these defense attorneys will show up on all the crime shows. Like Nancy Grace used to have a lot of these defense attorneys on when I was doing the shows. And they were on there before the actual case hit the courtroom. And I kept thinking, this should not be allowed. There should be a gag order. Because if you are, a, if you are working on a case, prosecution or defense, neither one of you should be talking to the public, period. This is a very, very serious legal event thing that's going on here. It is not something that needs to be in the media for everybody to, to so you can taint the jury, so you can taint, because that is what happens. Uh, it's one of the reasons um, with the George Floyd case, again, not a, try not to get not political on this, but that has got to be the most tainted jury ever. Now, I'm not saying they didn't do their best making determination because I say a lot of people are doing their job as a citizen, but my God, with the massive media stuff going on and, 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 and all the burning down of things, you know, if you don't have an opinion by the time you hit that jury box, I'd be really surprised, <laughs> you know, I'd be really surprised. So that's why I go on and on about a professional jury because a professional jury that's what they do for a living. So you you don't have all the hoopla. You're not bought by the attorney. You know, all the attorney crap going on. Hey, you know, this is my, I'm just doing one case after the other case after the other case. And therefore I'm looking at evidence, evidence, and evidence. And I don't have a, you know, uh, 
I'm not concerned whether the person's guilty or innocent as far as, you know, a personal emotional thing. Uh, I'm just, just doing my job, you know? Um, so I, I, you know, I just think this, this is a really thing, weird thing that, that they're already out here. The defense is I've never seen them do this where they're suing the police department before it even goes to trial. I mean, what a, unfortunately brilliant move. I mean, it should be, it shouldn't be allowed, but it's a brilliant move because it's now placed doubt on everything the police will ever take to court. There's going to be doubt about. And so it's going to be very hard to prosecute uh, Barry Morphew with, with this kind of stuff going on and get, and get a, what should be a proper conviction or not, or not being convicted. I mean, whoever goes there should be looking at the evidence and not being swayed by all this, all the stuff that's going on. But I just thought that was like amazing. I'm like, what the heck? So uh, that, that just that just blew me away. All right. Now I want to go to the question I'd asked you all. I'd asked you all about what case, what crime case? And you can answer now that you're here. I've had two answers so far, and I thought they were really interesting ones. Uh, and for different reasons. What what case, what crime case um, really affected you? You know, that you kind of can't get out of your head. The one that really, really affected you, uh, maybe early on in your life or maybe later on in your life, but just something that sticks with you. Um, and I, I'll point out the one for me. And this would be, and this is a great book on the case. It's called The Last Stone. And I probably will do a, a show on this one day. Uh, the Last Stone. And this is about the Lion Sisters. And the Lion Sisters, of, let me see what date it was, uh, 1975. The Lion Sisters, Catherine and Sheila Lyon, they were aged 10 and 12. They disappeared from the shopping mall. Um, uh, I think was, at the time, I think it was called Montgomery Mall um, in Montgomery County, Maryland. Um, and they were the daughters of a radio DJ, which is one reason it became such a big thing. And it was also two girls at one time. And they were, you know, they were young girls. Um, in 1975, I was in college or coming or living at my parents' house. I remember hearing about this when I was living at my parents' house. So either I was going to college or I dropped out and came back home again. <laughs> I don't know which one it was. But I this one struck me really big because, like many people, because we only had newspapers uh, for our town hometown, we never heard of serial killers. Um, and we, they were out there, but we just didn't hear much about them. So we went on our happy way. And I certainly had, you know, I, wa I walked to school. I walked all the way to my high school. And it was a dang long way. Um, I, I, I walked through woods. I walked through, you know, as, as people did in the 60s and 70s, I walked all kinds of places without without fear. And then these little girls, my mother, I just, I, I just somehow, I, you know, I had this one flash picture in my head. And I remember my mother saying something about it, which was weird for my mother because she wasn't much of a person who paid attention to these kind of things. But it must have bugged her as well. And she said, you know, these girls, and she said something to me. And I remember thinking, oh my God, you know, two girls were kidnapped out of the mall. And it just, it just hit me really hard because I think it hit home that the world was not as safe as I had thought it was. Even though by that time I was, quite frankly, I've been around the world actually, because in 1975, I'm thinking, I graduated in 1972 from high school. So I'd, I'd already been to Africa. Um, I'd been out in California. So it wasn't like, I wasn't innocent. But this was my hometown and there were little girls and I wasn't a profiler then. I'm like, this is my hometown and little girls kidnapped out of the mall. It just really blew me away. And what, one of the interesting things about this case, which I have to do more reading on because I've interesting enough. Um, I was actually, I was actually asked if I might profile this case actually uh, because they, 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 this guy, um, this, this case in 1975, but it was like, when did this happen that, um, uh, 2013 was when a cold case squad detective found something he and a generation of detectives had missed. And it pointed them toward a man named Lloyd Welch, then serving time for child molestation in, in Delaware. And I was contacted in 2013 at, about possibly working on this case by, because one, one of the detectives, I don't know, you know, it might've been this dude. Um, I can't remember who it was might have been this cold case squad detective who really liked me because I was doing a lot of Nancy Grace and he might, uh, you know, and, he, and the question was, would I be willing to do this? And I said, yes. And then <laughs> I'm going to say the, uh, you know, it was put, the kibosh was put on it because I'm, I'm outside the department. And so, but he did a fabulous job without me. So, you know, he didn't really need me. Um, and 
One of the interesting things about Welch was apparently he was in the mall that day and he actually was considered a witness. He, what he did was he heard about what the, somebody thought the guy looked like. So he told the police, I saw this weird guy that, you know, they had done a, a sketch of. I saw that guy talking to these girls. So he was trying to throw the suspicion away from him to somebody else. It actually really worked well. So one of the things they say about serial homicide is a good portion of the time, the actual serial killer has been interviewed by police within the first week or two. And then the case goes cold for years, but they've actually already interviewed the dude. And that's really, that's really goes to show you that you oftentimes the guy is somebody in the area. He's not like some guy who just came through town. I mean, there are those trucker types, you know, the trucker, the trucker serial killers are, you know, go through town. Guys, trucker guys, I love you guys. Best guys, you bring us our food. You bring us everything. I'm a big trucker fan. But once in a while, you got one of those weird dudes, you know. <laughs> and those truck stop, the girls at the truck stop who are like, you know, just want to have a waffle, <clears throat> you know, and they go missing. Uh, so <laughs> those those truck truck stop things. Uh, so anyway, but majority, a good portion of the time, the guy lives there within one mile, two miles of whatever it happened. And sometimes, many times, not sometimes, many times the police actually interview the guy and have no clue that that is the dude. And that's kind of that's kind of shocking. And it's something really, really worth understanding when you're doing a serial homicide investigation. So that was mine. Oh, my God. Oh, there's so many cool things. What? I OK, I'm going to start with the ones I know. OK, let me start with. OK, I want to start with David, because David pointed out, David, I'm so glad you came tonight. You pointed out, which I thought was amazing, was was West Memphis three. Um, I thought what you said was really cool. You said that in late March 1993. I was two months shy of my 13th birthday. I moved with my mom and siblings to Batesville, Arkansas. Batesville is a small town in northern, northern, northern Arkansas. A few weeks after we moved, Stevie Branch, Christi Christopher Byers, and Michael Moore were murdered in West Memphis, about two hours from us by car. I remember the news coverage was constant. Before that, I guess I was vaguely aware that children were sometimes murdered, but this was our first specific case of which I think I was aware. And this is what this is the sentence you said, David, which really struck me. I think these crimes st stuck in my mind for a few reasons. At the time, my younger brother was seven, about the age of the little boys who were killed. And I couldn't fathom why anyone would want to kill a little boy. I think that is a really, really interesting thing because a lot of times the reason it does strike us is because that child or that person is, is either our age or our child's age, or, or, or our brother and sister's age. And we have a real picture of them. Sometimes when people talk about the West Memphis Three, they know it's three little boys that got killed, but they don't have a real picture of the three little boys. Now you can watch the horrible video done, a Paradise Lost, and see actual crime scene videos of the boys actually in the stream, which is disgusting, and they shouldn't have allowed that. Uh, but still, the, you know, you, it's, it's like... you. To have a live being, you know, like your little brother, your little seven, like I have a seven-year-old granddaughter. I, you know, I just spent the afternoon with 